Awesome. Well, I just want to say thanks, Molly, for the introduction. And also thanks um, for everyone who is here with us this morning. We have 75 participants right now, which is like um, just such a such a wonderful number when you think about how long we've been um, t doing this project now. So uh, the interest continues to be renewed, and I'm just so grateful to be able to share with you guys this morning um, about uh, the history of Calipoyans on the land of the Willamette Valley. And um, also, I will leave time at the end for any questions that you have that are related to the presentation, but also just, you know, related to questions about um, Indigenous life or culture. I'm happy to answer. It is the first day of Native American Heritage Month. So, um, you know, feel free to ask questions. I also have another talk that's available through Five Oaks, which is called Rethinking Land Acknowledgements, which sort of goes over more broad Native history um, and some of Oregon's Native history outside of what you'll learn here, which is very um, specific to my tribe. So um, let me go ahead and share my screen really quickly. All right. Can you see me? Is that, does that look good, good? Good, Molly. Give me a thumbs yeah, up. Yeah, looks great. Good. Okay, great. So, um, I'm today. I'm going to talk to you about the the, uh, the show. This is Calipoyan Land. It's an exhibition that was originally created back in um 2019 uh can't believe it. this is crazy how long ago it was and um this was basically created when five oaks was was actually the washington county museum and then they had a rebrand sort of in the midst of the exhibition and also then the the you know the pandemic hit so um but we've been doing this show and also in, in many forms i'm so excited to tell you about them but before i get into um my exhibition exhibition I wanted to share just a little bit about the museum because it is really special and um I'm just as the introduction sort of hints at with Molly's talking about the current exhibition Five Oaks Museum is really special and the content that it creates for its viewers is is different than any museum that I personally have visited and I'm so proud to be um a champion of this museum and tell you about it so like I mentioned it was originally the Washington County Museum and was essentially created as like a you know a pioneer museum so that people could come and learn about um you know the history of the Oregon Trail and you know the things that Oregon mythos is sort of built around this museum is celebrating those things, uh, timber, you know, objects, things like that, that are very much about the sort of industrialization of the state. And so, you know, um, it was very much originally created to sort of celebrate um, the settlers of Oregon. And so um, within that collection, though, they had lots of native objects. And um, they also had a really popular exhibition. they one of their more popular ones is called This Calipoyan Land. And that's actually where my exhibition was born from. And uh, when they rebranded, they uh, actually, you know, renamed it after this site, the Five Oaks site, which you can go visit. It's right off of 26 and Brookwood. Um, it's a historical site that's in the middle of a business park but it the tree the remaining elder tree that is at that site is so beautiful and so um it's like when you can get back far enough from the site and see how big that tree is it's just like um takes you to this sort of ancestral place and I like to visit it because it does feel very much like um like I'm visiting the site where my ancestors would have come for generations. And so um, these trees are very special. And so the museum being named after that as a gathering place, is, it makes it even more significant. So um, yeah, the tr transformation of this museum from sort of serving the pioneer um, mythos and the, uh, you know, westward expansion um, fantasies that I think... Um, you know, American culture is really built on shifting that focus to serving the actual communities that are, um, you know, coming to the museum has been really powerful and created so much um, content that is not only interesting, but like transformative on like a spiritual level. And that is 
remarkable. The um, museums don't usually do those things. So <laughs> I'm very proud to be a part of Five Oaks legacy and um, be part of it sort of like a guinea pig um, initial sort of um, jump into this world. So um, this is Calipoyan Land was the very first exhibition that Five Oaks did. And as sort of as it's sort of changing over, um, changing of the guards. And the exhibition was sort of straightforward in that it was like um, art and history mixed together in in, in a very sort of standard gallery sort of experience. Um, but then we also have the online exhibition, which if you want to view any of the things I talked to you about today, you can actually go to the Five Oaks website and the documentation of the exhibition is some of the best. Um, we also have a, a yard sign exhibition. If any of you have seen those in the community, they're very popular. They get stolen a lot from what I hear. <laughs> and um, Five Oaks uh, still have as those available also if anyone wants to after this you know have their own yard sign exhibition so you can contact them and then I actually it says now on view but it's no longer on view at Piddick Mansion that closed in July I'll have to update that um but uh yeah we had a, another second iteration of this at Piddick Mansion this this year and that was incredible as well so this um show has sort of grown and grown in so many ways and I'm so proud of it and so proud to be a part of uh, like I said, the legacy that Five Oaks is creating for itself. Uh, so just a little story, a backstory about me and how I became this uh, first sort of, uh, what, what are we calling the guest curator of the Five Oaks Museum. They have a program where they bring in guest curators now, and I was the guinea pig. And uh, so they asked me to come look at this this ex exhibit that already existed in their, um, you know, in their museum, but they were sort of worried about um, its contents. What was it accurate? Was it even useful? Should we think about scrapping it? So um, when I visited the museum, we decided that we would keep it and that we would actually just edit it. And um, I actually took the took the museum panels home with me and lived with them for about a month and a half, uh, put them in the back of my Subaru. We loaded them up and I drove them home. And through co a collaboration with our tribal um, historian, David Lewis, we actually worked to correct these panels. And so sort of a remarkable story about David Lewis actually writing a letter to the museum 15 years prior to us um, doing this sort of reimagining of the exhibition where David critiqued the panels. And so the critiques that David had given to the museum 15 years earlier that were never implemented we sort of got to make right and implement his edits to these panels. And so um, it was a way for me to sort of heal some of that past history between the museum and David, as well as like show, show the fallacy of the idea that these institutions are perfect and that they are telling the stories like um, in unbiased ways. And so um, I went through with literally with Sharpies and all kinds of other materials and wrote over the words and, um, and really sort of like tried to add more context to things. And so the exhibition um, really is like for me, as an artist, but also as a writer was a way for me to sort of implement all of these um, things that I do as a creative, as well as being a curator um, and sort of combine them all into this one exhibition. All right, so I'm gonna read to you just, I'm reading you a quote of myself. So this always sounds kind of weird, but I should just preface it by saying that, um, but this will give you a little bit of background into what I was talking about with how I came upon the panels. Uh, when the museum invited me to look at the exhibition in its untouched version, the first thing that I noticed was the title. To me, the language as a writer was really important. The subtlety of words can actually create a mythology in a way. So when we say this Kalapoyan land, which was the original exhibition title, there's a sort of disembodiment that happens with that language. Like, what does that mean? Whereas is, when we add that word, it is very much now. It is currently our land. It has been our land. So it's also a land acknowledgement built into the title as well. 
Um, and the second quote, I think one of, uh, let's see, when you mentioned the dryness of the historical information, I think that the human experience gets lost when we look at historical information from a museum context. People are just looking at words or images of people from a different time, so it doesn't necessarily have contemporary context. So for me, looking at, when I'm looking at these panels, I see my family. I see my family history. I see the things that have happened not only to my family, but to the people in our community and continue to. So for me, it was important to emphasize that while these things have happened in the past, they actually continue to influence our daily lives in many ways. So um, as I'm sort of moving through my presentation, I'm going to sort of bring you through different sets of panels. And so um, there are multiple panels that were edited by me, and some of them, depending on their content, sort of have more intense edits than others. Um, and this was sort of the introduction panels that we use so that when people first walked into the exhibition, they're sort of oriented to the land, which is such an important part of indigenous identity, as well as sort of the context of the thing that we're talking about as Kalapoin people and where we exist. So um, the original panels that people saw when they walked in was this tribes and language set. And um, within this, there are some edits, um, but what I want to show you is we're going to zoom in, in to where I'm sure many of you are right now, which is on Kalapoin land. And as you can see from this map, there are many different bands of Kalapoyans, and actually we were a sort of massive genetic um, sort of uh, pool of people that lived um, from all the way north of Oregon, you know, sort of northernmost tip of Oregon in the Willamette Valley, all the way down into like the Eugene area. And so in each one of those bands of Kalapoyans had completely different sort of ways of life based on the land that they lived on, as well as their own languages. So um, we might have shared words, but many of us have very diverse language sets. So um, yeah, it was... Uh, the Willamette Valley is actually a very special place in the entire world because of how abundant it is. It was home to so many indigenous people because it could provide for so many indigenous people. And so prior to colonization, Oregon was not some, um, you know, sublime, per, you know, purpose or I'm sorry, personless land where uh, there were just trees and animals everywhere. There were tons and tons of people living for thousands and thousands of years, and um, we still are here as well. So um, I like to share that because many people don't realize Oregon is one of the most diverse indigenous populations in the country. Um, Portland is usually in the top 10 uh, urban indigenous cities in the country. So there's usually somewhere in the neighborhood of 50,000 native people just in the Portland metro area each year. So um, zooming in on the, the actual panels that I edited so you can see, some of the things that I started were just, you know, um, making edits of words like Indian. Um, that's not a, a word that Native people really love when white people use to describe them. <laughs> so, um, and it is a generational thing, I will say that, that the younger Native people really do not like that word at all. Um, they would much prefer to be, um, you know, referred to as an Indigenous person or a Native person. If you don't know um, a person's tribal lineage, you could say, Steph is indigenous, or you could say Steph is Kalapoyan, and each one of those is just fine. Um, saying Steph is an Indian might get you might get your reaction. So <laughs> I always like to tell people that because I get asked that question quite a bit, you know, what's the right way to say? So if you want to be safe, just say indigenous, that always works. Um, and as well, things like the word old, I crossed out the word old because uh, um, as you'll see, like natives are always portrayed in the past. We are never portrayed as being in the present. And so there's always like terms that are associated with our existence that um, it they just they sort of like stand out to me a lot because they reinforce this idea that we are just like in black and white movies that we don't actually live today uh, but i assure you native people still exist so um things like that uh, paying attention to language is really important because it is things like that that are very subtle like the word is that was added to this is Kalapoyan land because 
um, those subtleties actually sort of continue on the erasure that is happening and has happened to my community. Um, another thing that I, I just underlined on this panel, because I think <laughs> another dispelling the myth I love to dispel if I can, um, the word Willamette. Uh, the river is called the Willamette, which is actually it is sort of a term that can mean to spill or pour water or um, water spilling over is uh, basically what Willamette means. And it's named for the Willamette Falls, which if um, you don't know, the Willamette Falls, which are in Oregon City, are second only to Niagara Falls. They're the second most powerful waterfall in the country. And that is what the Willamette Valley is named for. And so um, I love to share that because I cannot tell you how many times growing up I was asked, uh, does the Willamette Valley mean the valley of death? <laughs> And I, I really don't know where that comes from. I am guessing it's from all the um, pollen in the air from the trees or something because we have terrible allergies and or I've, that's the only thing I can think of. But um, <laughs> it actually is named for the waterfall. And I think that's so beautiful and poetic. And I love to share that with people because it's meaningful and um, and it dispels a strange myth that I think um, is probably tied to, you know, sort of colonialism. Um, and along with all of these historical panels that I will show you mixed in in this exhibition was beautiful works of art from Native people. And so um, some of my most favorite artists were curated into both exhibitions that I got to do. And um, one of my most favorite artists is Angelica Trimble Yanu. And um, she is a very talented printmaker who went to the Pacific Northwest College of Arts in Portland. And that's how I met her. Um, but she lives in LA now and her tribe is uh, Oglala Lakota, which is in the, you know, sort of um, east of Oregon. She's not from Oregon. And so uh, it was cool to meet this other indigenous person working in print. I'm a printmaker. So I was fascinated by her work because it doesn't look anything like my work. Um, she is very much into the abstraction. And I love that about her. This is a monotype for those of you who are um, familiar with printmaking and monotypes um, are basically... Um, you know, a one-off print, that's it. Whereas like printmaking is normally used to like make replicas of something. Angelica uses it to make one-off objects. And I love that about her work. And um, her work is very much about her native identity. And um, and as I sort of share information about her, you will see what these objects mean. And this is called The Sun Bathed Everything. It's actually named after um, a line from a poem that her sister wrote. And as you, this is a picture of Angelica in her in her traditional homelands, photographing some of her work. And so she will take her prints, and sometimes they're presented in sort of you know uh, sort of normal two D ways, framed in a you know framed in a frame and on the wall. But she also folds them into objects. She makes mobiles with them that hang from the ceiling. She does all kinds of amazing things with these objects. But they're very much about the land and they're about the land that she comes from. And as you can kind of see by where she's standing, the stratification and the rocks, that's very much reflected in the work that she's making. And so um, it, it sort of calls up this concept that most people aren't familiar with, but very much is a, um, a sort of core part of Native identity, which is place-based identity. And so um, all Natives are from a specific place. That's why we call ourselves Indigenous, because it means to be a person of place. And so um, Angelica is a person of place. And so her work is about the place that she comes from. And so um, you like the work that I make is very much about the place that I come from. Uh, but I usually make work that has lots of trees in it because I'm from Oregon. And she doesn't make that because the work that she... The the place that she comes from isn't like that. So um, I love that because it is very much at the core of her work and is reflected in her work all the time. Um, and the way that she describes her work is really beautiful and sort of touches on that idea um, of you know, being from place. Uh, one of uh, one word in the Lakota language is special to Angelica. The word is layeska. Um, it means interpreter between two worlds. Sometimes a layeska translates between the spiritual world um, and the human world, or a layeska can communicate between the Lakota world and the settler world. Art can be a type of layeska. 
And uh, I think another core part of Native identity is this idea of walking in two worlds. It's something that I very much identify with and I see very consistently throughout Native artwork um, is this idea that we're always navigating between the traditions and the sort of concepts that we are taught as Indigenous people, those values that we take with us every day. And then, you know, we all have to go to a job and drive cars and do these things that maybe aren't necessarily in alignment with those values. And um, it's something that all of us are grappling with all of the time as sort of co colonized people, as descendants of colonized people who still are maintaining tradition in many ways. Um, and so that you will see sort of carries through other people's work in this exhibition as well. Um, okay, so this next set of panels, this is like my favorite part because I get to tell you about all of the cool things that we did on the land. So um, there's not a ton of editing that needed to be done on these panels because it is straightforward, right? So, um, you know, you see me sort of highlight different things um, as opposed to, and then also like adding words like strength and resilience to the top of the panels because, um, you know, this is how we are always seen by white people is abundant resources and trade. You know, that is like when you think of native people, that is what white people think of us is that we have a resources that we need to give up or we need to trade them away, you know, and um, so it really is reflected even in the way that, um, you know, these panels are sort of created about us. And so by me inserting things like strength and resilience, it's like, that's really what was important to us. Um, and abundant resources is really just a byproduct of the values that we carry as Indigenous people. And I'll explain to you a bit more about that. So one of the first things that we did as indigenous people um, was manage the landscape. And so many people don't realize this because um, we are called hunter gatherers. And so that implies that we didn't engage with the landscape in an, in an intentional way. And that's just not true. Um, indigenous people all over the world engineer landscapes. A perfect example of this is the uh, Amazon rainforest. Many people don't realize that the Amazon rainforest is engineered. It was engineered by indigenous people for thousands of years to be an abundant resource. That is why it exists. Um, and the Kalapoyans were no different than the people who manage the Amazon rainforest. So um, under our stewardship, the Willamette Valley, as I mentioned earlier, is very abundant. It is a very special place in the world because of how it was managed by indigenous people for thousands of years. And so uh, one of the ways that we manage the land is through controlled burns. Um, and as the panel talks about, it says um, that, you know, was, the Willamette Valley was a carefully managed landscape, carefully managed, you know, we weren't just like there willy nilly for thousands of years without having some sort of deep knowledge of the landscape. Um, part of the way that we did this was through controlled burns and harvesting. So um, the fields and prairies of the, 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 I'm sorry, the Willamette Valley are so special and so rich because of that management, because of fire and um, intentional harvesting. And we've been doing this since time immemorial. And when you hear that term immemorial, time immemorial, that means before memory. So um, we agree with scientists about two, about 20,000 years at this point, we've been on the land. Uh, we think it's more obviously, but we can agree with science right now that it's at least 20,000 years. So um, as I mentioned, control burns were really important and also are becoming, are coming back. They were actually made illegal um, during the time when they outlawed all of our religious practices, they also outlawed uh, controlled burns. And so um, we manage the forest density in Oregon very intentionally because of, we don't want to encourage wildfires, but also because uh, you can control bugs. You can do all kinds of things to like enrich the soil. There's many different reasons that control burns are beneficial. Um, also, another thing that people don't think about, uh, the Doug fir is considered sort of this icon on the Oregon landscape, but actually firs can be really damaging to a forest. Um, if you let them get out of control, then they will sort of overtake and then you'll have uh, what's called a, a fir desert, essentially, where nothing else can grow but firs because they blot everything out. So we would do a controlled burns to actually get rid of fir saplings so that they wouldn't overtake all of the other uh, vegetation that is trying to grow as well. Uh, the next um, 
object or object a uh, plant this a thing that is so important to us uh remains so important to us is the camas and it's a plant that um is important to many tribes along the pacific northwest coast as well as um the willamette valley um the there's also a white camas as well but we would harvest the camas each year and it has this beautiful purple electric flower on top of it but at the very bottom of it has a um, a bulb that's sort of reminiscent of garlic that we would harvest. And um, it's actually uh, related to asparagus, which I learned recently, which is pretty interesting. Um, and the camas is just like this part of our tradition that happens every single year. We still collect camas. We actually are working with the Portland Metro um, uh, department to restore traditional camas patches throughout the valley, which is just amazing thinking about that now as a native person who's like working to restore things that have been destroyed through colonization that now we're actually getting the government involved and I love that um here is an, a picture of one of our elders actually digging a camas bulb and as you can see she's holding a stick it's called a cup and stick and um each person in the tribe would have their own sort of cut to your own height. And on the top of the stick would have a, like a horn and antler essentially as a handle. And you use the stick to break up the soil so that you can easily pull out the bulb uh, from the camas. And then basically we would roast these um, under low, you know, sort of over low heat for a day or two. And then you have this sort of deliciously caramelized object um, that uh, sort of was sought after and obviously enjoyed each year because it was so delicious. Um, another uh, resource that was important and remains important is the white oak, um, is why Five Oaks is named Five Oaks. Uh, the white oak is um, uh, part of a system when I was talking about the engineered landscapes Oregon has something called the oak savanna and the oak savanna doesn't exist outside of indigenous intervention they don't happen naturally um, they're cultivated over generations and sort of oak savannas where we would go to collect the acorns of the oaks each year and so uh, we would harvest them and process them with a mortar and pestle and the question I have always wondered was whose job was it to carry the mortar and pestle? Because those things are friggin' heavy. If you've ever seen one in person, like, I don't know. I didn't know whose job that was. And I was wondering. And so I've, it turns out <laughs> that nobody had to do that. Thank God. Uh, we actually just buried them under the trees. And so um, that speaks also to our relationship with the land that we could bury our mortar and pestle each year after we were done harvesting and come back each year and it would still be there. And so we very much had a deep relationship with the trees and with the land that they grew on. And we intentionally cultivated that land so that those trees could grow big and abundant so that each year we came back, um, generations down the road, there would still be plenty for people. So um, that's what I love about, um, about learning about the land is that you learn how intentionally things were being done even before colonization and that like um you know this sublime reality that is depicted in um in you know this sort of colonial mythos is that actually these things weren't um, abundant out for no reason they were abundant because indigenous people were making them that way and so um you know there's a erasure that has happened to sort of justify our colonization to say well they were savages they didn't know what they were doing they needed us but actually we were doing quite fine and so um and, and many of those practices actually are are something that could benefit all of us now not just not just in the past, but actually can absolutely help us now. And and you see that even with fire science right now is coming back to controlled burns. And I have uh, many tribal friends that I know who work as firefighters now and do controlled burns every year and are helping um, firefighters learn this fire science that has been around since time immemorial. Uh, the next plant, which is actually if what's my dog is named, this is Wapato or Wapatu, depending on what tribe. Um, some people 
say it's Wapato, some people say it's Wapato, either is fine, but it is a very special plant that grows in sort of the shallow area of a pond or a lake, and it has a beautiful arrowhead shaped leaf that comes off of it and white flowers. And at the very bottom, kind of similar to the camas, is a bulb, but this bulb is like a potato. And so it's uh, essentially Wapato means water potato. And uh, we would harvest these by wading into the water and using our feet to break the bulbs up from the plants. And then as they break off of the plant, they actually just float to the surface. So then you can just collect them off the top of the water. And similar to camas, we would roast them over low heat and um, make cakes with them. So, uh, you know, uh, they're very um, versatile. They also have a lot of starch in them. And so they're great um, food that we could harvest um, and actually where we would sort of create our life around these plants in particular, um, specifically uh, Wapato Lake, which um, for those of you familiar with the area out near Gaston is where Wapato Lake is. It doesn't look like a lake right now. It used to be a lake. And this is actually where our overwinter camps would be. So this is where we built our longhouses and stayed over winter because um, it's much more of a sort of temperate place, not a ton of snow out there, access to, um, you know, the wetlands, so lots of food. And um, this is where Wapato would grow prolifically. And so um, this is actually where we wanted our original reservation to be when we were initially dr like drawing up treaties. Um, but because of how valuable it was um, in terms of, you know, agriculture, that was obviously not going to happen. So um, it was filled in, the lake was filled Build in and then they used it for irrigation and um, agriculture out in Gaston until, um, gosh, I feel like about about 10 years ago, the tribe and government agreed to start rehabbing it. And so now it's actually a preserve um, and they're working to turn it back into a wetlands. And I'm so, I'm so proud to be part of a tribe that is working with, um, you know, other entities to sort of restore these places on our landscape that used to be really significant to our culture. Um, and also, you know, our, um, remain significant, but also could be beautiful places for everyone to visit, not just tribal people. Um, another object that's really important to us is cedar. Uh, the tree itself can be sort of made into all kinds of things. Right behind me, actually, if you can see, this is my own cedar hat. And um, we can use cedar for all kinds of things. You can harvest the bark uh, right off the tree without harming it, which is amazing so that you can come back and harvest from a tree many times and never impact its growth. Um, we also used, uh, I mean, we made everything with this. Our baskets, our clothes, we wore cedar shoes. Um, you know, then we also have our plank houses, which I'll show you here real quick. This is a plank house. This is actually a Chinook and plank house in Washington, but this is basically what they would look like about three bus lengths long, usually are housing multiple families. Now they're more, um, they're just used for ceremonial purposes. But back in the day, they would have been where people actually lived, like I was saying, over winter, because, you know, you need a structure that can sort of withstand the more harsh temperatures of winter. Um, this is the interior of the contemporary pool house. So um, the one thing that would be consistent is the center hearth where we would have our fires. And this would be a place where you'd come to repair your baskets and catch up with other people that are part of your tribe and, um, you know, eat whatnot. But um, you probably would have had different furniture in here and things like that partition so that people could have privacy. But yeah, this is this is what we survived in. This is what we lived in. Um, another thing that's very important to us and actually remains pretty important to native culture is a dentalium. And actually, I'm wearing a dentalium medallion right now. Um, this is a shell that's not actually found in Oregon. Uh, it's found up in BC in a very specific area that's off the coast. And um, it's a mollusk shell that was used as money. And as you can see in this picture of this young lady, she is wearing a lot of dentalium. So she is letting you know that she comes from a very affluent family. Family. And um, dentalium shells are very expensive now because they were sort of overused by the trade industry in the Pacific Northwest, like uh, with the fur trade and everything, they just became super popular and over harvested. And so now to get giant dentalium shells like she has on her head, they're very expensive. So um, you don't see them that big anymore, but they are still remain a big part of our regalia. And um, yeah, and the only place you can really get them is Canada. 
Canada. So um, that speaks also to Willamette Valley and its connection to um, other parts of the world. People think that we were isolated, but actually we are part of a vast trade network. And um, we uh, interacted with tribes from um, up in Canada, you know, so our even our salmon, the salmon that came from the Willamette Valley was traded all the way up into Canada. So um, the abundance of the Willamette Valley served many people from all kinds of places. Uh, this is a illustration that's in part of the panels uh, called the the Calipoyan Man, and this was done before Lewis and Clark even got here. So you know um, that tells you as well that there are visitors to the region prior to even Lewis and Clark getting here. We were trading with all kinds of people. Uh, French fur trappers from Canada being one of them. Um, but this Calipoyan man is special because what he's wearing sort of tells you about um, his life. And one of them, the one of the things being his um, seal skin quiver. So he's holding a seal skin quiver. The Calipoyans didn't really interact with seals in the valley. So that would let you know that likely he traded with somebody on the coast to get that, that quiver. Um, if you also look at his shoes, that's a dead giveaway away because he's definitely wearing a white man's shoes he is not wearing cedar shoes so <laughs> that lets you know that he probably he probably ran into a french fur trapper and traded for his shoes because those do not look like the kind of shoes that we would have woven for ourselves and so it lets you know that he is a, a metropolitan man that he is very much out and about and interacting with all kinds of people not just um tribal people um of his own descent all right, so this next piece is one of my favorite pieces from the original exhibition. This is from Derek Lavore, who is from the Klamath Modoc tribe. And uh, this piece is a cow skull that is painted to look like a trout or a salmon. And the the ideas that we talked about with Angelica's work about walking between two worlds, um, that idea of the Liesca, this is very much what Derek talks about in his own work. Uh, here's this quote says one side of my family relied on work from the farms and the other side are members of the Klamath tribes. I understand the agony of both sides over dam removal. And for those of you who don't know the Klamath tribes just finally like just in the last year they're going to take the they're going to take the dam down and so the tribes have been fighting this dam forever since it was put up and it's very exciting but D Derek's talking about something that is very real for us which is that he also has family that are in agriculture and the dam will impact their life. And um, we can understand that the sort of the quandary and we can understand both sides and see how it is impacting. Um, we are not, you know, a monolith in terms of the way we think about things. We we don't want people to be impacted negatively um, on either side, but we also recognize how important it is to restore the environment. So um, this piece really speaks to that beautifully and also sort of goes back to that idea that we sort of are struggling with balancing these two worlds that we live in, you know? Um, all right. So, you know, these last panels, I'm sorry, I, I wish I had like three hours with you guys. I, I want to like get really deep into this stuff and I never can. But <laughs> these last panels are speaking about the treaties and about how they weren't really like the original treaties that we signed actually weren't honored. Um, and then, you know, uh, giving you some ideas, like I had mentioned about Wapato Lake and this original map that's on the left hand side. Um, you can see where Wapato Lake was originally sort of circle and that's what we wanted but we didn't get that we got um the grand ronde reservation which was sort of in this very remote place where um none of us were from traditionally grand ronde does not have an actual tribe um you know uh it's really it's just made up of 30 bands and tribes from all over oregon washington and northern california uh, but there isn't anyone who ever like called grand ronde their traditional homelands because it is sort of a um, sort of an isolated area with not a lot of access to water. So um, that's where we were placed and the treaties were sort of, we're still fighting to get them to honor them. We literally just had to go um, you know, make sure the state would let us hunt. We just in the last couple of like, I don't even know, just a couple of months, basically are, are getting some of our original treaty rights restored to us. So, you know, we're, we're still dealing with this. It's not something that's in the past for us. We are still dealing with treaty rights and, and making, you know, trying to hold the government to account in honoring them. 
uh as you can see in this timeline there this timeline that was originally in the exhibition was very much um focused on the pioneers it was not about Calipoyan history it was it was very much like first Oregon you know first person on the Oregon trail that's what was sort of prioritized in the original timeline so I worked with David, um, David Lewis to, uh, Dr. David Lewis, sorry, uh, to update the timeline and prioritize different information that was more important to us. Like, you know, when we were restored to federal recognition and given the opportunity to create our own um, constitution and become a sovereign nation again. So um, things like that were important to be on that timeline that just weren't. Uh, what was prioritized by the museum was very much the white experience. And so um, I highly recommend if you get Get a chance to go onto the Five Oaks website and check out the details of um, the edits that we made because there's lots of interesting stuff. Um, and the very last set of panels that I'll chat with you about are sort of the most painful ones, and um, they relate to the Indian boarding school. And so um, for those of you who don't know, Oregon was home to the second off reservation Indian boarding school. Um, and it was sort of a testing ground for uh, assimilation, essentially. And so it was originally built in Forest Grove, and it was there for about five years before it was moved to Salem. Uh, Chamawa is the name of the school. And actually, it is the longest running Indian boarding school in the country. It remains open today. It's been open for 125 years. And um, this school, unfortunately, has a really brutal history of abusing and neglecting Indigenous children. Children, um, as well as essentially just making them into slave labor. That's pretty much what these schools were for. And so um, when this was originally presented in the exhibition, it was just like presented in a way that did not give that context. It was just like sort of celebrating the assimilation of these children. And so it was really my responsibility to sort of make people realize what they were looking at when they were looking at these images um, of these children who had been taken forcefully from their parents into these schools of assimilation uh, where many of those children were never the same. They did not come back to their um, communities the same. Um, and a lot of them unfortunately didn't make it back at all. And so um, Salem has its own mass graves of indigenous children. All of these schools across the country have, there's like, I think there's over 500 in, in just the US, not to mention in Canada, um, of these uh, boarding schools where native children were essentially you know, forced to assimilate and learn English and leave their indigenous identities behind. Um, and uh, there remain very painful places that uh, you know, our community continues to grapple with the trauma of those schools. Um, and in sort of, in the imagery that was included in this exhibition, there's an image that is like sort of overused throughout the exhibition of these kids. And it's the very first day that they get to the to the school after they've been taken from their communities. And then there's a picture of them um, just a few months later. I think it's like, uh, you know, seven months later, uh, these children have been remade. They're sort of, uh, it's like a before and after picture, you know, and you can see their hair is different. Their clothing is different. Um, and you also might notice that there is a child missing because even within seven months of care by the U.S. government, uh, one child was already dead. And so um, these images for me are are horrible. And the fact that the museum, um, originally the people who created this exhibition chose to use them in such a callous way without contextualizing them was like, that was my first responsibility was to make sure the images were contextualized so that you understood what you were actually looking at, which is child slaves, essentially. Um, so I always like to sort of close my talk just by saying that, um, you know, while my community has a lot of um, painful history that it grapples with, we have transformed those traumas into something that is really beautiful. And that comes from our sovereignty that we have. So we are a sovereign nation within the state of Oregon. Uh, we make our own laws. And also we do things that are, are really amazing. Like I was mentioning before, the rehabilitation of Wapato Lake, um, the rehabilitation of the Camas patches throughout the metro area, but also uh, Willamette Falls. For those of you who don't know, the, the tribe just actually uh, broke ground this like two weeks ago on starting to um, restore Willamette Falls. They they built a paper mill on it back in the day. <laughs> we don't know why, but they they did that and they built this horrible, you know, in um, industrial structure on the waterfalls. And now the tribe is working to remove that 
so that we can be in to enjoy the falls again. And also um, not just we as a tribe, but we as a community, as a greater community, it will be what I would say is probably the crown jewel of the Pacific Northwest. And so I am so excited to be from a tribe that is transforming adversity into beautiful, beautiful things. And honestly, just really honored to get to share all of that with you today. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. And then uh, I guess we should open it up for questions now, if that sounds like a good thing to you, Molly. <laughs> I'll stop sharing my screen. Oh, yeah, you got to hit you got to hit stop record. <laughs>